Thank you very much, John, for uh, bringing this uh, really into focus. Clearly, the you know the potential, the benefits, um, the different examples are helpful, and that will help us sort of launch into our our panel discussion. And I'd like to you know open this up by. Uh, just starting uh, to ask each of our panelists to take a, a few moments and, and talk a little bit about the, the context of virtual exchange at your respective institutions, just to give us a little bit of a sense. So let me um, turn to Sharon first and ask you about how uh, virtual exchange has been uh, implemented or, or supported at Clemson, you know, sort of big picture. Thank you, Tony. And John, that was a, a great presentation. Um, I'm, I'm always reminded of some of the basics that, you know, I thought about earlier on. And now that I'm moving along on things, it's, it's good to be brought back to the foundations of it all. But at Clemson University, um, we are very fortunate in that we had started building this initiative a few years ago. And now that we're seeing the, the urgency and the uptick because of the pandemic, we were well equipped to really um, move things along quicker. But where it all, like most institutions, there were many faculty doing unique things in their classrooms that engaged partners abroad collaboratively, whether it was prior to the internet with the pen pal system, whether it was the initial um, impetuses with um, having students exchange emails abroad, but also more um, advanced and more creative and innovative projects that faculty were engaging alone on alone. We're a very decentralized institution at Clemson. So there were things happening out there in the colleges and in the curriculum because faculty will make things happen when they know it's good for the students. And so as far as it turned developing into an institutional initiative that really came with the most recent revision of our strategic plan which included a priority for integrating global learning outcomes throughout the curriculum. And that was not focused merely in gen ed, but it was meant to be. So the phrasing of that throughout the curriculum was, was very specifically meant to be th within gen ed as well as within the disciplines. And that gave us a um, kind of it opened the door for us to think about this more elaborately and it really has evolved as a collaboration between global engagement clemson online and our office for teaching excellence and it's those three offices that have built the infrastructure to support this moving forward um, but as we talk about the other questions you'll hear more about the specifics as well Great, thank you. Uh, Wolfgang, let me turn to you. Same question, you know, just sort of uh, an overview of, of uh, the uh, support and evolution of, of virtual exchange at Georgia State. Yes, uh, so, you know, I think similar to Clemson University, there has been a, a long history of individual faculty you know, engaging in virtual exchange, even if they didn't know that's what it was at the time. And, and I think that uh, grew over time into a, a, a small uh, group of, of champions and, and advocates that uh, could serve as the, 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 the basis for a more concerted effort. There were a number of uh, events, I think, they, that helped in the um, institutionalization of, of our efforts. You know, one of them was the workshop that John held, uh, uh, Tony, that you organized at, at Georgia State a few years ago, um, you know, which, which definitely uh, kind of brought together and, and added to this group of faculty who were interested. But uh, I think one interesting phenomenon is that uh, you know, virtual exchange efforts are going on all over the world. And in some cases, our international partners kind of forced us uh, to confront the, um, the need uh, for, for infrastructure and, and more structured uh, support. Um, you know, one partner in South Africa uh, uh, had grant funding to uh, send delegations to Georgia State University to develop new uh, virtual exchange projects. And you know, so we were faced with the need to organize this visit, uh, identify potential partners uh, at Georgia State. And that really, I think, started to build the kernel of, of a um, uh, kind of support um, uh, structure within the Office of International Initiatives you know, to, uh, because we just we had to deal with these uh, visits. But um, I think the, 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 the key um, you know, kind of switch came when we decided to in, in invest in an actual dedicated virtual exchange coordinator. And I you know, fully agree with uh, the point that John made in this excellent presentation. 
uh, that um, it is uh, absolutely uh, critical that this is not left to the goodwill and volunteerism uh, of, of, of faculty. Uh, it is impossible to get to a next level without you know, dedicated uh, institutional support. And, and that's where we uh, fortunately are at this point, uh, you know, perhaps not as long uh, as uh, Clemson, but over the past few years, we have uh, built that infrastructure with really good results. Great, thank you, Wolfgang. Uh, Steve, what about from uh, Georgia Tech's perspective? Well, let me let me start with my perspective, uh, which is slightly different than than uh, my colleagues here, because my background really is in technology. So I, I come at this from a technology perspective and looking at the affordances of technology to facilitate interaction. So I have a personal interest in international programs. Uh, and, uh, and that has sort of led me in this sort of grassroots level to, to do the virtual exchange programs. This afternoon, I think you'll get a chance to hear from Amy Henry, Amy Henry in the Office of International Education at Georgia Tech, who has a similar role to uh, Sharon and, and Wolfgang, and, and you'll hear more of the organized stuff. But, but for us, uh, I think it has been largely a grassroots uh, uh, modality still. Um, Georgia Tech is also very decentralized. In, in, in what we do. We also, though, have a very robust physical exchange program. So we have, you know, over 50% of our students participate in the global experience uh, currently. Um, so I, I think one of the, the factors that uh, is key when we discuss the idea of virtual exchange is that it's not a replacement uh, for physical exchange. It's, it's really an addition uh, to it that, that helps move it along. And that definitely, that's an important point, and we'll come back to that because I think it, you know, especially uh, is, is a relevant theme. So let me, let me take the conversation and ask, you know, building on some of the points that John had raised in his presentation and mentioned, um, I'd like to ask each of you to, to take a, a minute to sort of reflect on or, or, or think about or talk about what, what are the most compelling benefits of virtual exchange in, in your experience, how, how you've seen it, you know, unfolding. Um, what value does this add? Like, why should people really care about uh, this and, and do this? And let me uh, start with Wolfgang this time. Sure. So I, I think uh, many, again, many of the points that uh, John raised in his presentation would be valid for us as well. I, I was struck about the, the, the graph depicting you know, the percentage of students who have an opportunity to actually study abroad or you have a physical international experience. And that is you know, true even more for Georgia State University. Uh, with a student demographic that is uh, majority minority. Uh, yeah, it is uh, predominantly low income students, uh, lots of first generation students. And while we have made great strides in uh, sending students abroad, uh, you know, right before COVID, we were up to uh, about 1,200 students out of a total of uh, now 53,000 students. Uh, we know that there is a, a ceiling uh, to that just because of the uh, individual circumstances of, of students. So. The, the uh, equity or access accessibility aspect of virtual exchange looms really large uh, for us at Georgia State University. Uh, obviously, the benefits uh, uh, for uh, embedding intercultural competency into uh, courses is very important, but the um, the, the other uh, skills that uh, students can acquire through virtual exchange experiences, like digital literacy and the ability to work in teams uh, across different cultures, uh, I think are uh, just as important you know, from our perspective. Great, thank you. And, and Steve, what about uh, from your perspective? What, what are some of the, 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 the most compelling values this adds or benefits? Well, I, I, you know, one of the phrases John used, and I didn't write it down exactly, John, so I apologize, is, is the interdependency uh, that we see uh, today. And, and shortly after 9-11, uh, uh, I was going to hear former President Clinton uh, give a speech and he changed it and, and still delivered it virtually then. Uh, but he talked about the, largely because of the internet he, more than ever, we, you know, we live in an interdependent society, interdependent world. And that interdependency can be positive or negative and it could go either way. And I think it really behooves us to uh, try to move it toward a positive area. With virtual exchange, uh, you really have an opportunity to, to scale uh, that sort of positive interdependency. One of the problems, and I think Wolfgang alluded to it, is with physical exchange, which is great and rich and, and super, but it doesn't scale very well. 
and, and you know, we're about how do you expand these opportunities to the largest number of people? And I think virtual exchange allows the, the, the again, the ability to scale. The, if you think about in, uh, I think it was Clifford Geertz maybe in anthropology who said, you know, you make the strange familiar and the familiar strange. So it's one of the easiest ways to understand yourself is to be able to see yourself in a different set of eyes. And I think virtual exchange really lends itself to, to doing that for a large number of people. Great. Thank you. And, and Sharon, what about from, from your perspective? What are the sort of key values that this adds? Um, well, I certainly valued all of the points they made, but the, the value, the list of value of, outcomes is enormous and so yes the accessibility and the the general learning outcomes and the intercultural learning and the career benefits of having that ability to work in teams but i want to highlight a point john made very early on there are benefits to faculty as well so just as not all of our students have the opportunity to go abroad not all of our faculty have the opportunities to design a summer program where they can travel with students to the place they did a Fulbright earlier in their career. But this is an opportunity for them to share the research relationships that they have to deepen those relationships, expand those partnerships and share those with the students. And so it also provides, we've seen at Clemson quite a number of faculty um, find a niche in this. That is, this is a way in which they can engage internationally and grow their network and even get some research um, benefit out of it. And so let's keep that, those ben the benefits to faculty in mind as well as we talk about this. Great, thank you. And, and, and to, to all of, uh, to, to each of you, uh, you know, if anyone has anything to add about sort of the present moment, because this is a point that John raised and I think is an important one, you know, we'll come back to in our, our conversation, but is there something right now, you know, at present that layers of value sort of above and beyond what we've we've talked about. We know certainly the challenges to the, you know, physical mobility and, and, and that um, piece of, of exchange, but, um, how do you see this sort of serving the needs uh, of the present moment? Can I try a quick one here, Tony? Um, yep. I think there are a couple of things. One, one is the fact that we now know how easy it is to use technology. I mean, we've done it so much that the sorts of technology to support virtual exchange are not as foreign to us as, as they might have been before. However, at the same time, uh, my, one of my own personal hobby horses now is that we need purpose-built uh, educational technology. So, so even this Zoom that we're using, or if you use BlueJeans or WebEx or whatever they are, those are all things that were really built to support business-style meetings. And, and they're not really built to support education. There are platforms out there that are doing that. Uh, but, but from my perspective, these, these sorts of uh, uh, video conferencing technologies are really like a tiered fixed seat classroom. And if you build a tiered fixed seat classroom in a physical location, you're gonna get a lecture. Uh, so uh, I think, uh, again, coming from the technology perspective, it's easier to use the technology, but also reveals to us that we really need to purpose build technologies that support the, the rich activities we can have in virtual exchange. If so I may, yeah, please, Wolfgang, go ahead. Uh, if, if my, I may add, I, I think the um, ability of uh, virtual exchange to add uh, more engagement in an online uh, format is incredibly important right now. I, I have seen at, at Georgia State uh, when all of our faculty in, essentially had to switch to an online format in a very short time. Uh, you know, many of those faculty had not done this before and you know, there, there, there were lots of challenges in, in uh, you know, being as engaging in that online environment as uh, in, in a face-to-face -face environment. So uh, virtual exchange as, as one of those uh, tools uh, as a high impact uh, activity that engages students in, in a way that overcomes uh, some of the limits uh, of online uh, is incredibly important right now. And, and we you know, I'm happy to uh, say that uh, our uh, Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning uh, has embraced uh, you know, that approach uh, in exactly that context. And so, Sharon. Yeah, yeah so I, I would add that it's also a moment where we, well, first of all, virtual exchange is allowing us to maintain the momentum in global learning. 
where many of us have relied perhaps a little bit too heavily on student mobility for that, that this is allowing us to find some continuity in performing that. But we're also seeing some faculty who were very um, wedded to mobility as a way of providing global learning. We, we might get some converts out of this. And many who are where their programs have been disrupted and they're switching to virtual models and virtual pedagogies for this, while some of them will um, return to traveling with the students um, when they're able to, I believe that there'll be many who will continue to use virtual exchange to enhance their mobility programs. So we're going to see a higher quality of those mobility programs where students virtual exchange could be used to prepare students better. It could be used to provide dual access where you might travel with a cohort of students, but there might be an, another group of students unable to travel with you who could be traveling with you, but virtually, or it could be used for post travel reflection and integration of the learning. So I do hope to, that we'll see, I, I expect that we will see ways in which the virtual exchange will enhance the quality of the outcomes of our mobility programs as well. Great, thank you. And, 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 and this sort of leads into the, the next question I'd like to ask, you know, each of your respective institutions has some aspect of the global, you know, broadly construed, but as, you know, recognized as a strategic priority. It shows up in the strategic plan. It really, you know, has a, a, a place of prominence in that sort of big picture um, strategy of, of each of the institutions. I'd like to ask, you know, how, um, you know, how that is something that your your institutions have worked towards, you know, not only in terms of implementation, but one of the things that really helps bring strategic priorities to life is when they connect to other kinds of strategic initiatives or other priority areas. Um, you know, in this broader conversation about how we generate the interest, the support, the enthusiasm, um, you know, I think this is an important piece. And I'd like to ask you to, to, to speak to that, you know, like how does virtual exchange connect with not only that global pillar, which we all recognize that's the most clear cut, but are there other strategic institutional priorities that this, clearly connects to, but may not always be the most obvious thing. I, I'd, I'd love to you know, hear your take on that. Um, and let's go back to Sharon on this one. Um, again, there's a, a list as long as my arm for this. So let me try, try and pick the, the highest priority ones. So indeed, the so I mentioned earlier that our, um, re our current strategic plan sets a priority for the integration of global learning across the curriculum. And it's not, a specific gen ed requirement where that would be great because then you have something to link it to but in some ways having it so broad allows us to think about it throughout the curriculum and in many different ways and we look for ways in which if we can do exactly what tony's referring to how can we hitch our wagon onto other initiatives how can we help operationalize the aspirations of some of our the other goals on campus and the ones that come to mind for me immediately so of course there's things around intercultural awareness um, but within our colleges each of our disciplines have their own disciplinary objectives through professional associations from their own disciplinary accreditation associations so the nursing accreditation association requires intercultural learning for in a, in a in a nursing curriculum. Architecture requires that. Engineering requires this. So each of those disciplines are working to meet those outcomes required of their, of their disciplinary accreditation. And that's a great place to, it, to, to step in and say, here's a pedagogy and here's an infrastructure that John um, refer, said something that I wrote down. We're repurposing existing tools. So our online offices have the ability to assist disciplines and curriculum and, and departments to put some of these programs together. Our, our Center for Teaching Excellence can step in and some of their instructional designers will, will heed the call to work on this. So working within the uh, disciplines 
at the department level, at the curriculum development level, um, and also around, and we, we do this with gen ed as well, with the undergrad, with undergraduate studies. But I think that's been some of the success at Clemson is to really connect this to those disciplinary outcomes. Great. And Wolfgang, what about from uh, Georgia State's perspective in terms of how this fits into that broader uh, set of strategic priorities? Sure. So, um, as you said, uh, globalizing the university is, is one of five uh, major pillars or goals of the uh, university strategic plan but it does not go into a great deal of detail. So there is a lot of leeway in, in how we interpret that. Uh, and you know, we've chosen to, to uh, emphasize virtual exchange on this, but there are a number of, of clear uh, stated priorities of the university uh, that uh, where this fits in. One is student success. I mean, this is uh, what Georgia State uh, has focused on, has been very successful in. And it has done so uh, in, in, in a way that is data driven and, and uh, really very much focused on, on assessment. And so just like, uh, just like uh, CASI or the Consortium for the Analysis of Student Success through International Education has been able to demonstrate that study abroad is not a diversion um, uh, from student success, but in, indeed contributes to it. Uh, we are now working on, on documenting and uh, uh, demonstrating that the same uh, impact for virtual uh, exchange, which is a little more challenging just because the, uh, the, all the data is a little harder to come by. But uh, al aligning um, our efforts uh, to the overall student success goal is, I think, critical. Another one is um, uh, our current QEP um, university-wide initiative uh, to prepare students for careers, the College to Career uh, Initiative, which has uh, now um, adopted um, virtual exchange as one of the signature experiences uh, that uh, you know, provides some of the skills students uh, need uh, to be successful in their career you know, throughout their time at, at Georgia State. So they, that uh, unit has become a, a very important partner for our efforts and uh, I, th I think it's going to help us you know, get virtual exchange adopted even more. And I, I want to add one other um, point here um, you know, that is perhaps not so much an explicit uh, strategic priority, but the original strategic plan of the university focused on particular uh, countries where Georgia State would uh, develop relationships with and, and, and focus on. And for some of those countries, uh, because of travel advisories and, and other reasons, uh, physical mobility became a little harder and uh, student exchange became harder. Turkey uh, was one of them for a number of years. And we were able to use virtual exchange to have continuity in those relationships that we had begun and uh, you know, are still engaging with those partners uh, who are some of our most uh, active in terms of virtual exchange. Great, thank you. And Steve, what about um, from your perspective in terms of how this you know, fits in and, and maps onto other uh, institutionally uh, identified strategic priorities? Well, I think it's very similar to what uh, Sharon and Wolfgang have, have said. Uh, Connect globally is one of our six uh, strategic foci in our current strategic plan. Uh, but I, I'll give just a couple of things that, that uh, are, are a little different maybe, or they're not different at all, it's just we phrase it differently. I mean, we, we're very good at the uh, degree programs and, and skills that we give the students now. You know, our, our engineering programs are all the top five, our computer science programs are all the top 10. But where we lack somewhat is, is in the sort of 21st century skills that uh, are needed to supplement uh, those programs. So problem finding, communications, teamwork, uh, perspective. And, and I think the global exchange, or the global, uh, sorry, virtual exchange is, is exactly the kind of program that leads people to develop those sorts of soft skills, if you will. So they're very much an important augmentation part of, of our regular academic programs. And then, and then one final thought that is I think will become more and more evident. We encourage uh, our faculty and students these days to uh, take on big problems. And, and quite a lot of what we're working on nowadays has to do with uh, climate change and, and following the uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Well, these big problems are global problems. And if you're gonna take on a global problem, then you need to have the experience of, of working globally to, to really succeed and, and build those global teams. 
That's great. Thank you. And, and I'd like to, you know, shift a little bit, um, you know, the discussion now that, you know, one of the things that I, I think has been a perennially, a perennially important issue with this is how we engender support. You know, how we get buy-in, cultivate buy-in, both at the senior levels um, in some institutions, you know, there's different degrees of how centralized we are or the potential resources available. Um, but having top-down support and faculty engagement, how have you effectively um, brought people into this space, you know, both from sort of having that sort of senior level administrative support, but also, um, you know, faculty buy-in. How, how, how has that happened? Um, and let me, uh, let me start with uh, Wolfgang on this one. So, um, one, um, uh, one reason why we've had success uh, most recently is, is perhaps a, a temporary one. And, and that is, you know, you know just the, the current situation uh, with, with COVID and all the restrictions that come to that. So, uh, you know, by being able to offer you know, this new uh, uh, you know, way of engaging uh, internationally, um, you know, we really didn't have to do a very hard sell you know, to to faculty and and administrators um, you know, to get interest. Uh, but even before that, you know, we we had uh, created alliances with uh, some of the stakeholders across campus who were you know, supporting this already. Certainly, the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning has been a, a very uh, important uh, partner. Uh, you know, other units like the Atlanta Global Studies Center and the, the Global Studies Institute at, at the time have been uh, champions. And uh, yeah, particular departments where faculty uh, you know, maybe were, were clustered that, that already um, you know, during virtual exchange have been um, uh, instrumental in, in building this support. Uh, we, we've had, uh, I would say, um, you know, our efforts have been seen very positively by senior administration, and you know, certainly in the in the current uh, uh, climate, uh, this is not surprising. I think we have some uh, work to do to build uh, uh, more sustained uh, support uh, for these efforts uh, once things return back to normal, if that uh, ever happens. But there will be a shift of, of resources. There will be a return to physical mobility and, and some of the resources we've been able to uh, reassign uh, uh, you know, to help with virtual exchange may you know, go back to, um, uh, to the more traditional approaches. And so uh, this is not the time to, to rest and we have to build that support among senior administration. And one of the most important ways of doing this is the data and assessment and to actually demonstrate that this is not a neat thing but it actually helps you know, all the other strategic goals of the university. And that's an important point, and we'll, we'll come back to it. I've been seeing you know, in the sort of chat box with some of the questions related to the assessment and the, the data, but let me ask the same question to, to Sharon um, in terms of like how that support is cultivated. I know when we were talking previously, you know, the, the issue of how centralized the place is versus how much top you know, down support do you need versus bottom, but how is that really manifest at Clemson? So I think, as, as you've heard from all of us, the faculty are engaged if they, if they can find the, if they, they have enough motivation and they can find the space. The, the, the interest from faculty is not difficult to find. Finding the space for them to do it and the incentives for them to do it um, can, because of overload is an issue, but faculty interest is not an issue. And so we've been sec successful in that our colleges have supported faculty creativity in this realm. Um, the where I would like to go next with this because we and, and the other piece and Wolfgang spoke to this as well of engaging the other stakeholders. So again, working with our online office, our teaching excellence folks and really bringing in those practitioners at that level who will support the design and development and implementation of this that has been phenomenal. I was I was really surprised when we first started reaching out to them how quickly the instructional designers in our online office jumped on board and said, oh this is something we'd really like to do and that was even before COVID. Um, so we've had great success with that. And then of course working with those groups allows you to build a more integrated assessment um, system as well, which we're not quite there yet. So when we get to that question, I've, I've given you a heads up that I won't have much to say. But um, where I'd really like to go next with this is moving this up the chain. 
where the, the provost level and the presidential level can speak to this in ways when they're, or even our development officers can tell the stories of the success. So at this point, if we have a development officer working with a donor who shows some interest in global, our development officers are more likely to tell a story of student mobility. They don't yet have the stories of virtual exchange in their back pocket to pull out at that luncheon or at that alumni event. The president doesn't necessarily have the stories of success of virtual exchange. They're too new at our campus. And so in a, in a momentary, um, in a conversation where they have to improvise and talk about the great things we're doing globally, the story is most accessible to our leaders who are pre presenting us and representing us in those arena will still pull on mobility. So I think a next step is to get those stories told in such a way that employers and potential donors and others understand the value of what we're doing. Um, the other piece that we just started working on at Clemson, we have, and as most of us probably do, policies that govern the way in which student mobility and study education abroad programs are operationalized on campus. We have been trying to get around to revisit those policies because they were established quite a few years ago, and it's time to rethink them because what we're doing today is so different that um, we're having the conversation with our central administration about these policies and trying to, in, and, and we were very aware of the fact that we have to bring virtual into that discussion and to integrate virtual exchange into the larger understanding of what global learning is and any policy. So if we can build these into the systems and the policies and the procedures of the institution, that will establish an anchor for them and more sustainability as well. So those are two of the priorities that I have in my mind as we move forward over the next year, I'd say. Yeah, and I think that that really, you know, gets at the, how critical it is because I, I love the point you made, Sharon, about, you know, having the ability to sort of, you know, pull the thread through about, about what the story is, like what does this enable? And I think to the extent we were, you know, cognizant of that and really, you know, communicating that because if, you know, it is less known, um, it's a little harder to, to pull that, you know, story out and be able to, to tell that one. Uh, Steve, what about from your perspective? Yeah, so we, we maybe are, are a little opposite of, of uh, Clemson and, and Georgia State in that the upper administration is, is I think, on board. The president and the provost are, are very strong supporters already. Part of that comes from our, our very successful online master's programs. We, we offer these large scale, inexpensive online master of science programs. We have about 16,000 students in them right now from all over the world. We've got uh, we offer MOOC programs. We have about 5 million MOOC learners who are there. And so I, I think we are comfortable and, and supportive at the upper administration level of, uh, you know, increasing our virtual exchange, however we can do it. Where, where the problem comes in for us, I think, and, and John, as you had that slide of the, the bridge and the administrative support, uh, the, the faculty overload was something you put in there. But, but I, I think another one might be faculty acceptance uh, because we're at a research university and as, as our Clemson and Georgia State. Um, does it count for tenure? And you know, that, that to me is the largest barrier that, that we have to solve. Because if, if faculty colleagues don't value this when you go up for tenure, for, for the tenure track faculty, then it's gonna be very difficult to convince them to do that. And this is really a critical point, and I want to use this to start to pivot into some of the audience generated questions. But one of the things that I think is really remarkable here is we've got a huge range of institutions represented in our audience today, you know, throughout, um, you know, the, the University System of Georgia in South Carolina. We've got everywhere from, you know, research uh, universities all the way through to community college with different, you know, types of goals, different types of, of um, concerns. And one of the things I'd love to have us think about um, and speak to, and this, you know, I'd like to also open this up to John to kind of come into this uh, conversation. Um, you know, it, it, the key, you know, points about how, 
how we effectively, you know, figure out where we're starting from. So one, uh, you know, question, if someone's at a smaller institution, for instance, that has really invested heavily in traditional mobility, but sees the value and, and recognizes virtual exchange, that's going to be a sort of a different kind of set of concerns they have. They'd want to know what are, what are the kind of first steps. Um, and I think, you know, that, that what, what I'd love for us to start to, to, to have a conversation about is thinking about, um, you know, more broadly, you know, we've, we've talked about the values of, of, of virtual exchange. We've talked about how it links into career readiness and strategic priorities. We've, we've talked about, you know, a pretty wide range of those potential benefits. And one of the things that I think we're always like, you know, left with is, um, you know, how, how do we start to do that? Now, that'll be the focus in the afternoon session where we start to really get into more detailed examples and, and implementation. But I'd love to get, you know, the, the panel uh, and John's thoughts about, you know, helping meet people where they are and marshalling those resources. I mean, how, how is it, can we speak to that, um, you know, that very fundamental point? Yeah, uh, John, I see your, your hand. I'd love to, to bring you back into the conversation. Thanks. <laughs> it's been interesting listening to all that's been said, but one of the things I was thinking about was, you know, uh, the three panelists are all from rather large, well-resourced institutions, and I think many of the people in the audience are indeed from smaller institutions. Uh, and from my perspective, I think the smaller institutions actually have an advantage. Um, and I think the there are many of them. One is the more local the institution, I think, the more it has to offer in virtual exchange. When you have an institution that's already very internationalized, um, there are many outlets and vehicles and approaches to having this uh, kind of experience. But at a small community college, particularly in a rural area where there's almost none, or there may be almost none, um, they can present their community to another group. And to me, that's the essence of what COIL is. And so I think there is actually a kind of inherent advantage to being smaller and more locally oriented once you can make the switch over to working with colleagues abroad. I think you have something to offer. Um, and sometimes that can be complex. I'll just uh, anecdotally from working in New York, um, many SUNY institutions, colleges are in the sticks. They're in rural areas. They are way out there. They're in farm country. And partners abroad assume anybody with NY next to their name <laughs> is somewhere in downtown Manhattan clubbing and et cetera. And so it was always, no matter what you would say, a phenomenal experience to convey what their actual situations were to their partners wherever they may be. It was really eye-opening for everybody. So I think we should look at these as pluses. The other piece, and I speak especially to community colleges, although it's not true for all, is that many community colleges have a history of teaching online because they have to reach, the, their clients are typically people who cannot be residents at a college. They're people who are working and are older and have families and can't really engage in the way that a 19 year old can, even if they have some 19 year olds. And so I think they actually have a kind of experience level that some of the larger institutions do not have. Uh, again, back at SUNY, I found that community colleges were better able to jump into this than the large research universities. In fact, at least at SUNY, I hope it's not gossiping, the research universities were far and away the worst at doing this. They really stumbled and couldn't kind of get over their own feet to get involved. And that was because they were so focused on research, doing such amazing things, that they weren't focused on the classroom and pedagogy. Now that's certainly not true for all research universities, but I'm just trying to set up the fact that different institutions are really different and even thinking about how you would approach doing COIL virtual exchange, I'm using the COIL word, you're all using the virtual exchange word, uh, you really have to look at your institution and see what it is you want out of this what your strengths yeah. are. 
Thank you, John. And I, I'd like to go to Wolfgang really quickly because I think Georgia State is relatively uniquely positioned in this space because not only are we a big research university, but we have a perimeter college, which is just as much Georgia State as any of the rest of the colleges. And, and so we've got this sort of microcosm where there's a kind of a community serving college aspect of, of this. And Wolfgang, in terms of our experience at Georgia State, like, can you speak to this sort of engagement and, and, and uptake and how that sort of, um, how that's played out? Oh, absolutely. That, that is a uh, intriguing point because um, it is uh, true that uh, among our um, champions of virtual exchange at Georgia State University, uh, faculty from Perimeter College are actually uh, overrepresented. Uh, you know, in, in fact, uh, we, you know, we have uh, we have seen interest all over uh, the, the university, of course, but uh, Perimeter has really been uh, in, in the vanguard uh, of, of setting up uh, virtual exchange partnerships. And I think part of the explanation uh, for that is uh, you know, that faculty at Perimeter College are supposed to be focused on teaching, uh, not, not on research. And, and you know, I think Steve mentioned you know, earlier, you know, this doesn't contribute uh, to tenure and, you know, you know why, you know, you, you folks don't think that's really matter. Uh, and, you know, teaching matters in a, in a, a two-year uh, context. Uh, uh, we, I should also add that uh, not just at the perimeter, but also in the downtown campus, um, you know, we, we uh, work a lot with um, uh, lecturers or faculty who really have a, a, a teaching mission and, and they've really been among the, the biggest supports not certainly not exclusively but that that's an important uh, aspect so yeah absolutely I think uh, especially as institutions that have more of a focus on teaching as opposed to research you know, virtual exchange should be easier to do than at a large research university and I think that gets to a point that is really critical here is, is as we think about how do we effectively advocate for and, you know, we were again going back to that we've all sort of spoken to the issues of the value, but seeking that alignment, you know, when, when, when a faculty member is trying to think about should I engage with this, what's the, what's the benefit, how does it align with how I'm going to be evaluated and measured and what counts. Um, you know, that's something I spend a lot of time really thinking about, like, how do we do that? Um, and I think, you know, to John's point, Wolfgang just echoed this, and, and, and I'd love to uh, uh, go to Sharon here. We, we know that, you know, like you've said, the Clemson faculty have really, you know, come and in, in, in become engaged. How have you threaded that needle um, in terms of having, you know, that sort of range of everybody from lecturers who are more clearly, you know, evaluated on the basis of their teaching and pedagogical innovation and quality versus research faculty who might actually have or be engaging in research uh, collaborations that are uh, global in nature and have the network there, but just trying to find and foster the bandwidth to do this. Like, how have you um, been, been able to thread that needle? It's a good question. I think like Wolfgang, I would say that we are seeing some of our lecturers, a, a large number of our lecturers show interest in this. Those for whom teaching is their primary um, passion, interest, and responsibility at the institution. So we do see quite a few of our non-tenure line faculty um, engaging in this and, and taking it on. But also at the other end of the spectrum, you know, I'm just thinking about a few faculty who have built programs that engage both mobility and virtual exchange around research and research that that in, that, that they're doing. And also we have one example in bioengineering of undergraduate students who are, re, or who are have patents pending based on work that they did through these programs. So, and that's, that's not Kyle and I doing that. Those are the faculty finding the ways to do this through what it is they're doing with their research and with their own careers. And they're integrating these options into what they have and and both of the two examples that are front in my mind existed before we started building the initiative um, i think what we need to do is make these tools and this pedagogy 
better known to our active faculty and for them to begin to think about how this can support their research. So those who have the NSF grants that include the, mobil the, the funding to include students in mobility and in their international research, how can they begin to integrate the virtual exchange aspects into that? And that's what we're beginning to see at the other end of the spectrum. Um, and I, I would, in my, I'm, I'm kind of lost for what to say because I think we're too new in this to really assess how that's going to evolve or what's actually happening there. Um, so I can immediately think of people at both ends of the spectrums. The ones in the middle are not that obvious to me at this point yet, but hopefully those will emerge. And I, th I think that what John and, and Wolfgang and, and you too, Sharon, have said is it, it struck me a little bit because we are very richly resourced you know, our, our faculty all the time collaborate globally on NSF grants or, or whatever. It's just it's how business works. We have a campus in uh, Lorraine, France. We have another campus in Shenzhen, China. And, and it's, it's so many rich resources are there that it's easier almost to not do virtual exchange because we've got other things there. So you're, to your point, John, that, that the, the richly resourced places may have a harder time doing it. That makes total sense to me.